Uh, says sending data and no. Now it says online. There we go. There we go. But yeah, there we go. All right, we're gonna have to take a look and see why that's not connecting to my existing things that we pre-configure over there on YouTube. How you doing there, friends? Um, my goodness, it's been a few weeks. Um, gosh, we had the American Labor Day that we took off last week. I was off. I had uh, took my daughter out to Penn State and had her out for a tour of uh, of school, looking at. Gosh, I'm looking at at schools for for my daughter to to uh, graduate and go to college. Let me tell you, that's quite an experience. Um, but we're we're getting there. Um, let me see. I'm going to send a message to folks here on YouTube real quick. Um, something wrong with this event now broadcasting at. And there's the link. All right. Um, so I'm back. We're going to be talking more about C Sharp for Beginners. This is a very beginner-friendly stream. We're getting folks used to, accustomed to what's going on with uh, all the great stuff that's happening with .NET. And I want to make sure that, that you're successful, that you get the answers you need. All of the samples that we have here are live and and available for you out on the GitHub. Check it out at github.com slash C Sharp Fritz slash C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. Let me show you what that looks like. We'll head over to the other side of the code and uh, we'll welcome in some friends here. So good to see you. There we go. There's, there's my GitHub. C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz will get you in and you'll be able to download and work with the notebook that we're going to be using today live on stream. There you go. There's a link to it in everybody's chat so you can take a look at it. Let me say hello to folks now that we've got our YouTube friends online. Nitro Evil, good afternoon to you. Charles Galuli is here. Let me head back. There we go. Uh, Arshia, hey there. I'm doing well. Rivon9, Janescu, good to see you. Surly Dev, I'm doing well. It's the beginning of the week. I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. Edu Tomasi, hello, hello. Just call me AD. Good to see you. Um, bus one hero. You like, you like the beard? Thank you. Uh, Robert, love the hat. Yes, we are Penn State. Um, there's a, there's a legend that goes around that year. For those of you that aren't familiar, the Pennsylvania State University, uh, university I graduated from, um, has a very, very famous cheer, uh, it, it, right, for raising spirit athletic events, um, where one half of the arena will yell, we are. The other half yells, Penn State and the 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 legend goes that a uh, long time ago here in the states back in I think it was the 40s um, the football teams getting ready to take the field and Penn State has a has a player uh, who's a, who's a person of color and the other team refuses to take the field because they don't want to play against somebody who's a person of color and the the that player says it's okay guys you can go with that he says and the team, team captains say, no, no, we are Penn State. All of us. It's an inclusive statement saying everybody belongs. Everybody is a part of our community. And that's a pretty cool thing to, to celebrate every time that the, the student body, that the, the, that the fans want to get involved. And, and um, I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of that. And they had a big win this weekend, big, big win in college football this weekend over uh, our friends in from Auburn. Um, so let me keep rolling down here. How's it going there, Ark? Adonis Adipos, good to see you. Amal, it's been two weeks. It has indeed. Uh, Abhishek, what about Python? We're, we're not touching on Python today. We're, we're working on C. It's called C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. We're working with C Sharp. Um, Nadim Pali, good to see you. Uh, that's right, Nitro Evil. We are Penn State. John A. Addo, good to see you. Um, it is it is a nice story. It's a legend. I don't know how it's um, I, I don't I don't know if it's truly been validated, but that's that's the story that that we've been told. 
The 30 second review of collection concurrent bag. I'm not going to get that deep, um, but I will take that offline and, and we can discuss further. I want to I want to get in and get it get to the basics of arrays, uh, lists, dictionaries, and how we can use those and start to use link to interact with those and get folks past uh, past those basics here. Um, let me get some music playing in the background. Of course, I like to have some music playing in the background while we're writing code and learning together. Um, and today, I'm going to go grab the uh, stream beats. Where'd it go? I want the lo-fi. Right? Synthwave, EDM. Yeah, all right. We'll go with the Synthwave playlist today. Now, let's skip down a little bit. I want to go somewhere down here. This is the Synthwave playlist from Stream Beats. This is music that's designed to be royalty-free, DMCA free. You can use it wherever it is you might be streaming. You can listen to it. It's a nice set of uh, tech beats that you can listen to um, for free. There's playlists for Apple Music, uh, Amazon Music, Spotify. Check it out. Streambeats.com. Thank you so much to Harris Heller for making this music available for us to listen to today. So it's kind of important to to pull together and uh, and have some music that we can all listen to. Um, so kind of groovy, just have it there in the background. Um, let's see what else. Where are donations going today? We don't do donations when we're over here on the Visual Studio channel. Um, for those of you that don't know, maybe you're watching over on YouTube. Maybe um, maybe you've you've seen some of my other streams. Uh, or you're watching on Visual Studio Stream over on Twitch, or maybe you're watching on Learn TV. Um, when when I stream over on my channel on Twitch, um, if folks do want to donate, if you do want to contribute, subscribe, cheer, uh, we make uh, donations to a to well known communities, uh, charities that are going to help various folks. Uh, and this quarter, the third quarter, 2021. We've been donating to Women Who Code. We've donated to Black Girls Code and Vets Who Code and all kinds of other organizations um, over the past two, three years. Really happy to be able to pay it forward and support folks. Uh, Brad, Bradfield Phillips, greetings to you in Cape Town. Bill Gates, uh, he's still around a little bit. Not too involved with Microsoft anymore. Tasmania is where Paul's connecting from. Hello. Hop in the cloud. Good to see you. Getting some coffee into me today. Um, so, is um, I, I don't mind answering that question. Typically, I like to stay around the the topics that we're going into. But last week, .NET 6, Release Candidate 1, was released. You can find that. You can find out more about that at devblogs.com. Uh, I'm sorry, devblogs.microsoft.com slash .NET. Um... And I will bring that up real quick. Put the .NET on the end, if you don't mind. There we go. And yeah, yeah. Let's head back over there. Um, so I'll answer a mall's question there. Uh, MWJ Computing, go green, go white. Uh, you, your Michigan State team did very well this weekend as well. Um, here we go. Announcing .NET 6 release candidate one. This was announced last week. For those of you that are keeping track, you want to follow along, you want to learn more about the next version of .NET, .NET 6, being released in November as part of .NET Conf, our annual virtual event. In its 11th year, um, the .NET team puts this on. There's a full day of community content on the third day of the event. But we'll be releasing uh, .NET 6, which is a long-term support release. You'll get at least three years of support with .NET 6. That'll be released in November. Now, to, to the question from Amal a little bit ago. Um, .NET MAUI. The next... Um, here we go. The next version of the tools that we're making available for native development. Designed to allow you to build for Windows, Mac OS ios and android are going to be released as a preview at at the time as the dotnet 6 release so they you will not have a full release it's taken a little bit of time 
for us to get there. It's not at the quality bar that we want, that, that we want to make sure you expect from us when we deliver high quality programming frameworks and tools. So we're going to delay it slightly. There'll be a preview release still available. We're continuing to iterate on it. We're continuing to work on it. You can find out more about what's happening with .NET MAUI, how it's progressing. You can still develop with it. We're still iterating and releasing and working on this in the public. You can find our work on this on the GitHub repository. It's all available out there for you to be able to interact with, ask questions, file issues, and more. But you can find out from uh, Scott Hunter here. He writes a blog post all about what's going on with .NET MAUI. I will share that link for you out there. Uh, Cross-platform user interface. That's right. It doesn't quite work like, like WPF. It works more like Xamarin, but it's still XAML based that you can work with. Um, taking a look here, uh, looking at some more of the comments, some more of the questions coming through. Um, when is Visual Studio 2022 officially released? I don't think they've announced it yet still. So I'm not going to comment on that because they haven't announced it. Um, they do have a goal when they want to have it announced, uh, when they want to have it released. Um, if they haven't announced it, I'm sorry, I can't disclose that. Um, we can certainly go back to the Visual Studio blog. And this is where the team releases their blog post, the Visual Studio blog. Um, and I don't think, yeah, Preview 4 came out beginning of last week. So there's the link for the blog here. You can take a look and see more about what's happening with Visual Studio, but I don't think they announced the the final release date yet. Um, and I will I will save that announcement for their team to be able to announce. Um, and and Mads Christians in here, right there. So, um, how you doing there, Astra? Good to see you. Uh, .NET six, Entity Framework six, .NET Maui. Uh, updates to Blazor all coming as part of that .NET 6 release. Yes, yes. Uh, what IDE editor do I use on all of these, uh, all of my streams? I, I use Visual Studio 2022 for the purposes of these streams for the next few weeks as we're working with .NET notebooks to teach and learn more about C Sharp. We'll be using Visual Studio Code as part of those, uh, as part of these uh, sessions. That was a question from Paul Watts over on YouTube. All right. I think, how you doing there, Thin Dog? Good to see you. So that's more information about Visual Studio. Preview 4 is available. You can download it now. You can test it out completely free of charge. You're welcome to download and interact with the that preview version of Visual Studio. .NET 6, always, .NET is always, always free. All the tools, doesn't matter what editor you're using Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, your own editor. Maybe you want to use JetBrains Writer. Maybe you want to use VI. Maybe you want to use Emacs or, or something else. Brackets. Whatever. Sublime. Sure. Notepad. Mm, notepad. Really? All available for you to use completely free of charge. You can build and work with .NET on all of those editors. You started out in Notepad Thindall? Oh my goodness. Ice TTV. Hello, welcome. So good to see you. You wrote Pearl. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So we're going to be over here. We're going to be working in this GitHub repository, particularly down in the notebooks. And we're in notebook 0105 today, Collections and Generics. I will share that link. So you can click through, follow along. You can clone this repository, run it locally, open it in in github right you can actually just hit uh i believe you can just hit period here just type hit the dot key on your on your keyboard and it'll open in visual studio code in the browser and i believe it will install and run the extension for you for working with that notebook there it is so Right? Yeah, it'll run these live. So you don't even have to install anything. Just hit the period key while you're looking at that GitHub repository. It'll open it in GitHub and you can work with it. No problem right here 
and follow along. So, um, really cool stuff. But I'm going to be working over on the big screen, and we'll be uh, taking a look at it that way. Uh, so let me go back over to there. Um, how you doing there, Janescu? Good to see you. Uh, do I do a tutorial with Discord JS? No. This is a beginner's lesson on C Sharp with connection collections engineer. So, um, all right. I think I'm just about ready to go over to the big screen and get us up to date there we go how's that sound uh, a little bit different because i'm on a different microphone but i'm going to head over to the other screen and we are going to be all set for yeah for our lessons on collections and generics with c sharp all right let me head over there and we'll get things started all right give me one minute to get over there with my uh, with my coffee here Got to head over, do the walk, do the walk through the uh, the thing here. Um, oh, one second. I got my uh, my headset turned around and not not plugged in properly. Hello, hi. We're over here now. See, got to have that cup of coffee. It's it's developer fuel. That's what coffee is, right? Here, right there. Um, <laughs> all right, so I am going to keep... I've got, uh, I've got chat open over here so I can see what's going on. I can also see a little bit of my background over here. Um, let me take a quick look. I'm, I'm seeing that the, the green screen is... Uh, I thought I had it adjusted properly. Let me... Just tune that just a smidge. So, it's the beam that keeps on going. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. There, that's better. Now you can't see that. All right. Um, walk, walk, walk. I know, right? Hop in the Cloud says, I, appreci I appreciate Maui being delayed. I've been following .NET Maui. It's going to be very cool, and I understand Microsoft wants to make the experience of using .NET Maui from day one of release as awesome as they can. Thank you. Yes, we do want to make sure that it it's a valuable tool for you. Um, so we're going to we're gonna do our best to make sure that everything works the way that it should day one. And there, there's a couple challenges that the team is having. And... Um, to make sure that everything is delivered properly, they're they're giving themselves a little bit of a delay here so that they can get things done. So, as with all projects, we have timelines and milestones and just didn't quite hit the milestones that we wanted to that would be appropriate for that November release. You still love WPF Bus One Hero? Well, all right. That's, that's perfectly fine. Got to get that lighting even. I know, right? Now it... Now it looks right here. Now we're in good shape. All right. Today we're talking about collections, generics, and we're going to take a peek into Link. All right. So collections, generics, I hinted at this in some of our previous streams. I showed us a little bit with some for loops and, and in going through and working with a, a collection of numbers, a collection of things, how to go through a loop, a for loop, a while loop, a do loop and how to interact with those and and do those looping expressions and go through and and discover how to work with one item at a time in that set okay that's that's fine but what can we do with a set of objects with that collection of objects an array is a very common structure in many different programming languages and frameworks. And that's a, right, that's a one-dimensional matrix that has just items laid out in it that you can work with. And we'll, we'll see more about how an array is, is just the beginning of how we can work with collections, because we also have other collections like lists and dictionaries and hash sets that we can work with inside of .NET that each have different features different functionality that you may choose to work with but 
they all come back to an enumerable collection. They all are based on that same enumerable collection. And we can take advantage of that with a technology called generics to make it even easier for us to interact with those objects. More on that as we get into the lesson. Let me take a look at chat. Thank you, John, for the comments. Yes, I've got to support my Nittany Lions. You know what I'm saying here? Got to support those those blue and white folks in State College, Pennsylvania. These releases are like rocket launches. Failure is not an option. Curious Drive, you're, you're, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, let's see. Adrian Monk says, now that .NET is unified, we will never talk about .NET standard never again. Am I right? Um, I, I wouldn't say never again we'll talk about .NET standard. It's something that we want folks to, um, as they no longer need to support .NET Framework or Xamarin um, or those older technologies that are are going out of support. .NET Framework will stay in support, but if you don't need to work with .NET Framework, you won't need to work with .NET Standard. Um, we want everybody to be on .NET 5, .NET 6. That's the goal. But if you do need to support across .NETs into .NET Framework, you will need to work with .NET Standard. Um, converting as much code as I can to .NET Standard so you can change the front end as a last step. Totally agree. Will I cover immutable collections? I wasn't planning to. Um, I wasn't planning to cover immutable collections. I, I can add that in at, at the end, give a link out to that, and we can go show how those work. Um, <laughs> Arshia with a question here on Twitch. What's the point of storing objects in a matrix? So if you have a multi-dimensional array, a matrix, right? Um, and the, the simplest matrix is going to be two dimensions. If you want to store things in a two-dimensional matrix, they have different, th those objects are residing in memory and they may have different um, different properties based on where they're residing. You'll see a lot of this in, um, in game development where they need to manage a bunch of different objects in memory that are all interacting and doing different things at the same time. So that's a, a scenario where you, you're going to have lots of different things to manage and you may want to have different, um, different dimensions that things are residing in for different purposes so that you can easily find those things and work with them. Uh, let me see here. I don't see too many folks from YouTube chiming in here. How are we doing, YouTube? You still, are we still connected over there? Let me know. Um, let me see. I think we're all right. No, looks like we lost connection to YouTube. Did we lose connection over there? No, I, it's, it's, come here, you. Uh, do, 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 do. yes, we do. Yes, we still have connection. Good, 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 good. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, Fantastic. Oh, awesome. There's some YouTube folks ch chiming in. Thank you so much. Uh, good. I was I was a little concerned because of how how the, the connection didn't start quite right for today. All right. So let's let's get into this. Let's get into the topic here. Um, I am not familiar with that book, Zeus. Zeus just got started with collections in the book C Sharp Programmer Study Guide. No, I'm not familiar with that book. Uh, can you drop me a link on on Twitter? Uh, same name on Twitter, C Sharp Fritz. Drop me a link. I'll take a look. Um, you're in listening mode? Not a problem. Um, it, I, I look for the, the connections from the, the uh, two different um, chat rooms, and I saw a lot of Twitch and didn't see any, anybody connecting in from YouTube. All right. So let's talk about this. Collections, generics, and a peek into link. So um, collections, th there's a bunch of different collection objects that you can work with in .NET, and I mentioned some of them. Let's start with arrays here. So let me zoom in just a smidge. So arrays are reference types, and the simplest of the collection types can be declared with one-to-many dimensions and can also be declared jagged, 
So it doesn't necessarily need to be the same, uh, the same depth, the same uh, number of elements in every dimension. You can simplify, uh, there, <clears throat> arrays are simply declared with a type and square brackets. This should be simply, there we go. Um, so there's the square brackets, defining the size of the array initialized with a new statements and curly braces containing the initial values of the array. So you can declare an array and put those first items into it all on one statement. So if we take a look here, now I'll zoom out. Um, you can declare, look, I have an array of integers by saying int square brackets numbers. So that's an array of integers called numbers. Now, um, it doesn't contain anything initially here as long as it wasn't assigned yet. So int numbers, there's nothing in it. So uh, I'm going to say display if numbers equals null array is created and it'll say true there. Now, if we recreate the array using square brackets and we define a size, a number of elements in it, right? So right here, int three, it'll tell me that there's three elements in there and the array is not null here. Now, um, there is a length property that will show you the number of elements in the array. So we can say array size numbers.length. And we can also declare, here's a, here it is, declaring with initial values. So there, full array of numbers, int one, two, three, right, right here. So we're going to put those initial values into the array, full array of numbers, and we'll display that information. So array is created, true. The array is not null in that second block because it, it has it has elements, right? The second display array is null, right? There's actually elements. The elements are null, but it has three elements in it. And it has, right there it is, three elements. And the full array of numbers, it has a full length here. And I can actually add another, let's add one more display here for full array of numbers and run that again. Now, notebooks, when you say display and you pass in some sort of object, go display this thing. If you pass in a collection, .NET Interactive Notebooks know to display as a table like this. So there's my index, 0, 1, 2. All arrays are uh, base 0 indexed. They start from 0, and the values are 1, 2, and 3. So this way, you'll see developers like to count starting from zero so all right that's an introduction to arrays let me take a look at the chat room let's see anything else that's that's being asked here uh can you tell what is asked at a microsoft interview no i cannot sorry can we get some love in the chat for arrays yes please it's bananas good to see you um when you need control but it's open to lose versatility versatility Is it possible to create an array of type object? Asks Curious Drive. Yes, you can create arrays of type object. So let's create another array here. Um, you know what? I'm going to do it in... Let me create another code element just below this. Uh, come here. Where's my plus? I should have a... Yeah, right there. So I can create an array of type object. So we can say object... Uh, and this is my curious array, right? So that works. I've, I get a green check that it did create that. And we can start to put objects into it. Um, so let's say this is a new object array and I can put different things into here. Uh, let's do this, uh, and date time now. Um, and if I display that array, I get, because it's an object array, when it goes to display that object that's in the array, I'm, 
uh, the .NET notebook is giving me the type of each object that's in the array. And then it's giving me the value cast to a string and output here. So you can work with objects as, as that most abstract reference type that you can use inside your array. Absolutely. And put all kinds of different things in it. Um, Arshia asks, can arrays have children? Like integer of size three only has three values or it can have an array inside an array. Yes, you can put other collections inside of an array. So, but at that point, you're doing a multi-dimensional array, right? Um, we can we can start to declare that as a different size. Now, if I go down here, I can reference the items that are inside the array. There it is. I can reference the items inside the array with that index number. You saw the index number down the side here. I can reference them by using the square brackets. This is called the indexer of that array variable. I can reference it and it will give me just that one value. So if I reference the zero width item in here, it will give that back to me. And I can also set values on the array by interacting and saying the zero width item equals five. So full array of numbers, when I interact with it here, so item zero starts off as the value one, but I assigned the value five here, go display again, and now I have the zero width item is five. So we can manipulate the contents of our array. What we can't do is add items to the end of the array, okay? Once the array size is defined, that's how big it is. It's three items in this case. You can't go and, and shrink it or resize it by just saying add or remove items, okay? It's going to stay that one size. And that's one of the benefits and one of the cons, one of the drawbacks of an array, because you may want to dynamically build the size of your collection. Let me take a look back at chat, answer some questions. The display function is interactive notebooks. Yes. Uh, not going to talk about iAsync enumerable. No. It's a little bit further advanced than I want to get into. Is there something like the spread operator, like star in Python, to unpack the objects from array one by one? Um, I'm not familiar with the spread operator. It's, I mean, you can do a for loop <coughs> or a while loop to interact with it. I'm not quite sure what you're trying to do with a spread operator. That's right, Curious Drive. The string data type, so in C Sharp, uh, in .NET, the string data type is an array of single characters. So, just like we did here with these two elements. <clears throat> um, I'll add another block here. So if we define string, uh, my string equals, we'll say Fritz, we can reference each of the characters in that string using the indexer. So if I say display my string, uh, and let's say uh, zero, one, two, three, four, and we say display four, I get the, the character Z, okay? Because it's the fifth character in the array, in the string Fritz. All right, so, I mean, this gives you a way that you can manipulate strings by interacting with the elements of the array, the, the character array that is the string. You can do that. There's other string tools that are available that allow you to work with it a little bit easier but this is available to you, okay? Um, additionally, there is a, uh, there we go, two character array method on strings, and it will actually turn it into an array, and there you go, it's displaying, here's each of the elements in that array that makes up the string Fritz, okay? So, good question, thank you so much for that. Curious Drive over on Twitch. Um, all right, moving on then. 
So you cannot interact with array values outside the size of the array. So if we try it and interact with, with numbers that are outside, right? So there's only three elements in our array, full array of numbers. So if we try and work with the fifth item in the array, we get a big old error here. Index out of range exception because you, you tried to work with the, the fifth element and there's only three in it. So it, it breaks, it throws an exception to say, oop, can't do it. Can't interact with that. Now, here's, we, we had a question about multi-dimensional arrays. So if you want to work with, right, the two-dimensional array, you, you can put an array inside an array. This is a little bit more efficient way to do it. Um, so if we have a matrix, and we say that that matrix is three by two, I can define, here's my three elements, each with two elements in it, okay? So this is multi-dimensional array, and when I say display matrix dot length, the length is the number of elements in that array. Well, the array has six elements in it because it's three by two, okay? And we access elements in that multi-dimensional array using a comma to separate and specify each of the dimensions we want to go across to find things. So if we want in the zeroth dimension, the first element, the second, el I'm sorry, in the first dimension, the first element, and in the second dimension, the second element, we're going to get the value 2, because it's right there. All right? So, you can, you can resize the array. It's not something that that you want to do. It's very, it's a little bit destructive. There's a lot of memory thrashing that happens to do that. So if we interact with my numbers, we allocate it as three digits here, and we try to say, well, add another element to the end. Just put another one on there. There is no add capability to do that. So you need to do this resize interaction. So we say array resize and you pass in a reference. So work with this my numbers array that I defined and resize it to size four. Let's assign in the fourth slot, zero, one, two, three, it's the fourth slot, fourth element, let's assign the value four and display my numbers. Uh, oh, I gotta, this didn't work. Come here, you. There we go. Didn't compile, so now this will work. There we go. And now I have a fourth element. All right. So you see, we have to do a resize to make it the size that we want, and then we can interact with it. So... By default, interacting with an array is easy to do, easy to, to put things into it, get those values back out of it. But once it's de declared of that size, you need to do things like this to change its size. We have other collections that are better, better optimized for that type of interaction of dynamically adding and removing elements from the collection. Things like a queue or a stack. Those you're dynamically adding things to the collection and removing things from the collection after compile time. That's okay. Um, after declaration time, I'm sorry. You're changing the size of it. Let me take a look at chat. Um, yep, Arshia, I, <laughs> I just showed that. Um, so it sounds like you probably asked that question right as I was showing it. Uh, you once tried to draw a 4D array, but your brain exploded. Well, hmm. isn't my numbers already a reference type? Why was it passed with the ref modifier? Ask um, Amal over on YouTube. Great question. It's passed with the ref modifier here. It is a reference type, and we're passing it with the ref modifier here to ensure that the reference of my numbers is being changed. That's being modified. Right, I can't. I, I, I can't pass it like that. You must use the ref keyword to indicate that it is being passed by reference, and it's going to be updated. It's going to be changed 
there. Um, DJ Squared asks, is there a performance advantage to using an array over a list or another uh, collection type? In college, professors really hyped arrays. However, professionally, I've pretty much never used an array. Um, there is a little bit of a performance benefit to using it. It's because you're, you're not allocating and reallocating memory for changing the size of things. So you're, you're forcing things to not be um, allocating and reallocating memory um, as, as those collections change size. So it can be placed in one location in memory and it doesn't move around because in, in the memory uh, heap because it's, it's not changing. We're not reallocating things, okay? When you need to add new things to it, when you do this resize, it actually has to take it off the heap, change the size of it, give, put all your stuff into it, and put it back on the heap and get rid of the old one. That's a very complex operation that if you have a lot of things going on in memory, you have a, a very memory intensive application, you will feel performance impact of that. But if that al uh, array is one size, it's never going to move in, in memory, right? It stays in one place. The, the application knows exactly where to find it in memory. So you don't have this thrashing that'll occur, all right? And the, consequently then also, the garbage collector isn't running a lot to go and clean up these things that are no longer being referenced. Arrays are very cache friendly. Yes, it's bananas. Yes, yes, yes. So, all right. We are moving through this quickly. Look at that. Look, you, you can't see this. Look at that. I'm already, what, about a quarter of the way down through this today? Oh, man, we're doing well. Um, all right. So if you reference the array somewhere else in your code, that reference will not be resized as well. Yes. So arrays are reference types and references to the prior object are persisted. So if we, let's resize my numbers again. This time we're gonna make it five elements and we'll put the number 100 in the fifth element there and display my numbers. Now we captured a reference to my numbers in reference to my numbers first. It's a reference type. So when you assign it to something like here, right, all that we're storing is a pointer to that. But when we do this, we're being passed back a new array. So one, two, three, four, 100 is what was in my numbers, but in reference to my numbers, it's only one, two, three, four, because it still contains a reference to the old array. Right, so to that question that we had just a few seconds ago, right? When you reallocate, when you resize an array, it creates a new array of that size. So scrolling back up here, it created a new array of size five. Fritz's new array, whatever it is, it's doing it behind the scenes. It puts it into memory somewhere and returns it into the my numbers variable. Okay, so now my numbers is a pointer to our new array. However, reference to my numbers is a reference to the old array. It's still out there in memory because this has that reference. Does that make sense? So this is where we start to run into memory leaks because you've got a reference to something that, and, and it was destroyed somewhere else, but because you have that reference over here, somewhere where eh, you might not remember where you were referencing it, it never gets cleaned up. Yeah, that thing that you were doing over there, that goes away, but over here still persists, still hangs around. That might be a good thing for you, might not. Depends, depends on how you want to use and interact with memory. Um, taking a look back at chat, let's catch up here. Um, Johnny B. Cat on YouTube asks, how can we reassign a value in the array? So right here, we assign the value 100 to the fourth element in the array, right? Well, it's actually the fifth element, right? Because we count from zero. 
So it assigns it to the fifth element. Real easy. If I want to, um, if I want to add or, or change that, right? So I can just say, uh, right? It was my numbers, and I'll say the fourth element equals. Uh, um, I'll set it to the value 28. All right, and uh, here let's say display my numbers. So now the first element here is my numbers and you see it's now 28. So to reassign a value in the array is just set it equal to that new value. Just like you, you might expect when we're interacting with um, other, other objects and other properties. So, yeah, memory leaks, here we go. It's a new array, but the elements maintain the old reference. No, they're copied. They're copied, Fernando. So, um, Lakshan asks, can I explain stack and heap memory? Um, briefly, we, we did discuss this in a previous stream, but I'll briefly describe it. In .NET, we have two different locations that we store things in memory, the stack and the heap. The stack is where we store our value types. Numbers, booleans, characters are stored on the stack. Um, very quick interaction with it. Objects, these value types are allocated and deallocated and removed and cleaned up and, it kept, and it's being kept very neat and tidy. Reference types, classes, strings, dates, um, arrays, collections like this are reference types they're placed on the heap and and the heap is is a, a large area of memory where things are allocated and deallocated when things are no longer used and they're deallocated our application says don't reference that anymore there is a garbage collector in .NET that will come through and collect and clear up that memory release that memory so the rest of your application can continue using it so it's very important that we optimize for when we need to optimize for performance that we keep our memory usage and our allocation of things for the heap, our reference types, as small as possible. Where you may have seen the impact of this is when we think about .NET 5 and .NET 6. Starting with .NET Core 3.1, there was a new type that was brought into um, into .NET called span of T or memory of T. These two types, instead of instead of being a collection that that sits out there and sits on the heap and and takes up space, and what this does is it instead provides a pointer to somewhere in memory where our data is allocated. So it doesn't allocate new data. So we end up creating these little value types that reference where this data was allocated. Starting with .NET Core 3.1, but more efficiently seen in .NET 5, and you're really gonna see it in .NET 6, behind the scenes in the, in the framework for .NET, we're using those spans and memory collections to generically reference where these data types, where these, uh, this content lives in memory so that we can interact with it faster. We're not reallocating memory. And when you think about how a web server runs, a web server passes a lot of strings back and forth. The, the web browser the, that you're watching this video now in is made up of HTML, a bunch of angle brackets and string content that declares to your browser how to format the page. And there's a bunch of strings that are passed back and forth between the web server and the browser to indicate what type of content it is, how fresh it is, if it needs to be re-requested, the, the format of it. Hey, this is a video you're watching. You need to format it and present it as a video. All that information is being passed back and forth as strings. Well, if when our web server receives those strings, if we're not reallocating a bunch of memory to work with those strings, our web server can run much faster because it's using less memory. And that's part of the basis, very simplified basis, of how .NET has the fastest web server available. I hope I hope I covered that well. Let me know, chat. Um, so DJ Squared, going, going back to this sample here, 
Let me go back. DJ Squared asks, step one up here, reference to my numbers, points to my, the initial collection of my numbers. Yes. Step two, we resized, and it points to a new place where this new my numbers collection is is going to live in memory. However, you're right. Reference to my numbers still points to that first location, that first address, right? This is pointing to some address, some location in memory. 123 Main Street is where, where this is residing in memory. When this reallocation happens here, the resize, it's actually allocating new space for that my numbers, and it might be on... 456 Main Street, right? It's a different address in memory, right? One's at the beginning of the street, the other's a little bit further down the street, and it, it's somewhere else. Well, it the the application returns here that okay, here's my numbers. It's all resized for you. It's got an it's got an extra floor in it, so we have that extra element that we can we can contain in our array. And oh, by the way. Uh, my numbers now lives at 456 Main Street. It's somewhere else. But you're right. Reference to my numbers still thinks, oh, I know where this thing is. Reference to my numbers lives on 123 Main Street. It still lives in that same first location, even though my numbers is actually a little bit down the street at 456 Main Street. So you are correct. It just points to somewhere else. This points to somewhere else, but reference to my numbers still thinks you live at 123 Main Street. So, right, it hasn't gotten that change of address form. Uh, let's see. Can I give an example why our code should not reference an object anymore? Don't we need all the code to be available for it to work? Yes, we do need all of our code, all of our things in memory to be available to us. You're right. However... When you finish a method, when you're done interacting, you're done doing your calculation, interacting with and, and figuring out what it is that you may be doing in a method, at the conclusion of that, all of those intermediate objects that you created in your method, you don't need them anymore. They're done. They're, they're no longer going to be referenced. They go out of scope because the method completes. They're, nothing references them anymore because the method is done. At that point, we want to clean up. We want to remove those things from memory because the next time your method runs, it's going to go and create new objects to go and work with. And those need to be somewhere else. So where the method ran the first time and it allocated its objects, go clean those up because the next time it runs, we're going to allocate again. So we want to make sure that those are cleaned up and no longer being referenced and not an issue Right? Because if they're still hanging around, you might not get the same, the, the expected values you wanted. Because the old objects are still hanging around. Alright. Good questions. Thank you, chat room. Alright. Good. Let me move on then. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, that dark blue is hard to see here. Stack last. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, is that Lakshin? You're welcome. Um, can I print out all elements of the array? Ragnar on YouTube asks, can I print out all elements of an array without a for loop? Um, there's a couple ways you can do that. So here inside .NET Notebooks, the display method here outputs those elements. If I wanted to display those elements without a for loop, I can do something like a string.join. So I can do something like this. And I can specify the separator that I want. So let's give it a comma and give it the array that you want it to output. So I'll say my numbers. And when I run that, um, put a display before that, Fritz. Otherwise, it's not going to do anything. There we go. So now it outputs it as a comma delimited array. There's other things that we can do to interact <clears throat> with our array using link, the language integrated natural query. More on that coming up a little bit later because there is so much we can do with that. For each is one of those items in link. That's right, Cannonade on, on Twitch jumping in with that. Um, so, and it is, the, you're right. The, 
bananas it's bananas over on twitch says there's always a loop hidden somewhere while i'm saying string dot join here underneath the scenes it's doing a loop there's a for loop there that it's doing don't tell anyone it'll be our secret just you and me and the rest of the internet <laughs> all right moving on shh 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 don't tell anyone don't tell anyone. all right it's it's just between us all right just between us friends here okay uh, um moment on youtube says uh printing too much data using four or a four each loop will it cost too much memory um no it won't cost too much memory printing printing too much data no it'll use more processor you'll use right more your processor will um act on more of your data yes all right i'm gonna move on and let me scroll down here we did that reference so we can do a remove with that same array resize and it eliminates elements from the end of the array so if we do array resize my numbers to three instead of it being four elements now it's three and it's down to those three elements same thing just resizing you can resize up and add more elements you can resize down and remove elements and they come off the end of the array so we can't go and remove the two in the middle you can't do that right so <clears throat> when you're working with arrays you don't have that flexibility to poke around and, and remove and interact with the elements in the middle of the array you're only adding and removing on the end the last element all right hey straxor welcome um it is pretty efficient that's right so a 3d polyrath there you go all right so arrays are enumerable that means that you can count them right you can go through and do a step interacting with them they implement the i enumerable interface so you can you can iterate over those contents so you can do things like for each right and we we, we know what fours are in many other languages and we saw looping constraints uh i'm sorry looping constructs previously so we can do a for each when we work with a collection that is enumerable so we can say for each var i in my numbers and display that when we do that it displays each one of those elements um that should be like that no let's see that didn't that didn't do what i well, whatever so we can work with the array fill method here and we can fill our array with values so we can if we allocate a uh an array and we want to call it my one array we want to fill it with the initialize it with the value one we say array dot fill give it the name of our array and what you want to put into it ones and we'll display that array and we get our array of three ones so may be valuable to you if you're and right you want to initialize a collection you want to make sure that it's it's got some wide number of elements and they all default to they'll default to zero perhaps right maybe you're you're um setting up a, a baseball scoreboard and you want to default every inning of the baseball scoreboard to the value zero sure you would do something like this to make sure that everything starts with zero uh, maybe baseball scoreboard isn't the best example because maybe you want null in those in those innings of the baseball game when that haven't taken place yet so um your choice right different ways that you can do things hash tables and sorted lists are two other types of collections here that you can work with but these have keys that you can interact with so a hash table is sorted based on the hash the hash hash sorted based on the oh look at this we got to get rid of that that shouldn't be in there um yep get rid of this in the so that it goes to each value 
where'd it go that contained stored on the hash hash there we go that's better sorted based on the hash of the keys and a sorted list is sorted based on the key value so what if we had a collection of um, file extensions key value pair sure so we can have txt we know that's plain text mp3 is compressed music jpeg let's call it a jpeg compressed image now if we create that as a sorted list it's going to sort by the value of the key so we'll get jpeg mp3 text because right alphabetical order j m then t if we change that instead of being a sorted list to being a hash table well now it's sorted based on the hash of that now for our human eyes it looks weird and out of order right that that doesn't look right that it's text file then jpeg then mp3 that's that's not alphabetic order that's not something that that our human eyes are going to look at and that doesn't make sense to us but when we think about the hash and we think about finding elements that are the same in that collection dot net behind the scenes does that by calculating the hash of an object so interacting with a hash set is a lot faster for .NET to do compared to compared to us where it's going to have to go find well all right this is a j for jpeg go find that in the list it can calculate the hash very very quickly and immediately find that location in the collection let me take a look back here at chat i see a couple more questions coming in here what features does an array have compared with a collection of i innumerable um so right the array has the array has these abilities to interact with the um not just the length but also resizing you can go backwards and forwards in the array right i i can randomly choose which element out of the array i want where an i enumerable is a forward only collection all you can do is say give me the next element in the collection which for all these other types of collections like hash i'm sorry hash table sorted list that's what a hash table not hash set hash table sorted list dictionary we're going to see in a little bit generic list all of those when you're enumerating through it it's just give me the next element in the list there are other ways to go and interact with these and grab values at specific locations inside that collection and that's going to be part of the reason why you would choose to work with an array compared to a list or a dictionary or a hash table or a sorted list they're all used for different reasons okay good questions good questions how you doing there jeff brooks welcome in so is a sorted list is a built-in type that's correct chris jones yes what is the difference between a hash table and a key value pair? Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I can't read the, the characters in your name. Um, a hash table is, is a collection of key value pairs, right? We have a, a key text. We have a value plain text. The hash table is is a collection of these elements. It's multiple key value pairs. So, right, it, it's a hash table is composed of key value pairs. And we'll see key value pairs used in other types, not just sorted list. So you have different places that you can use that key value pair technology in collections in .NET. And, and like I was saying, how they're stored, how you interact with them, um, how they're presented, the order that they're presented varies based on those different types of collections. And we, we saw here, as a hash table, these are presented in this hash order. As a sorted list, they're sorted based on the, the text of the key. We have other types like stack and queue that are sorted based on the order that they entered or the order 
uh, yeah, based on the order that they've entered the collection. A stack is um, first in, last out. So the last element that you've added to the collection will be the first element. You'll see this in a little bit. A queue is first in, first out, right? Just like you might queue up at at your favorite uh, your favorite restaurant, wait to get inside, wait to be to to be assigned a table or whatever, or at at the local coffee shop. You're queued up, first person in line is the first person to receive their coffee. At least that's the way it should work. So. What's the difference between a dictionary and a hash table, asks uh, TG on YouTube. Um, let me get there in just a little bit. Um, Rick has been a, a developer for two years. Uh, Rick's joining us on YouTube, and he says, These videos always teach me something. Thank you so much, Rick. That's very kind of you. I, I appreciate that. You, you love my videos. Thank you so much. Um... Can hash table allow you to have a duplicate key? Asks uh, Chang Liao Scott over on YouTube. No. So if I add another entry to my hash table here, right? So, right. Not only do I have plain text, I have Fritz's cool text, and we execute that. <clears throat> Item has already been added. And that's not just a hash table. That's that's just a key thing, right? You can't add the same key multiple times, even if it's a sorted list. Sorry, item has already been added. Let me scroll that up so you can see it. Right, so you'll get an exception that you added this thing with the same key. So, good to know. Good question. Thank you so much for that question, Chang. Um, really appreciate you pointing that out, that... Yeah, you, you can't add the same key twice. The key is unique within the collection. So, how you doing there, Rambling Geek? Joining us over there on Twitch. Good to see you. All right, let me... I'm going to comment that out. And I'll add a note above that. You cannot add the same key twice. Cool. Oh, sure enough, it's the next one here. Um, fine. <laughs> uh, that's what I get for not scrolling down. I completely forgot that. Oh, yeah, that's the next sample. So, compressed music. If we try and add it a second time here. Right, there it is. MP3's already been added. And it's compressed music. So, the those key value pairs, hash table, sorted list, are enumerable i enumerable so i can do the for each and go across those and there they are because i've referenced them they are dictionary entries inside that collection right so the collection returns to you a dictionary entry object and then i can reference the key i can also reference the value and get the value back so neat way that you can interact with the entries of that and if I don't reference the key or the value, I get it displaying each one of those elements. So I'll let you play with that. You can you can run these live in the um, GitHub repository. Just hit the period key, open up the this notebook, tinker with this, see how those things work together. Go ahead and break things. It's not your machine. It's all in your browser. And you can interact with with the with this .NET interactive notebook any way you'd like. You're, you're not going to hurt anything. You throw errors, that's okay. No problem. Well, it'll tell you how to fix it. It'll tell you what the difference is here and, and how we can work around those things. Um, and, of course, there's always lots of great folks on YouTube, on Twitch, on the .NET and Visual Studio channels, .NET on YouTube, Visual Studio over on Twitch, and, of course, out on Twitter that are happy to answer your questions if you run into issues and you need a little bit of help. Um, can hash table be implemented as iObservable? Uh, there's a different collection type for, for that, the observable types. Uh, you're going to be looking at, like, reactive extensions to be able to do that. And I'm not going to get into that. Um, Alex asking, am I going to get into the concurrent collections? No, I'm not going to get into concurrent collections. Um, I'm trying to stay try to stay a little bit beginner level 
<clears throat> but I have had enough questions about about concurrent and immutable collections. Um, I'm I may add to the bottom of this notebook when when we finish here offline. I'll add some content. Um, what's the difference between the index operator and the add method? Um, excuse me. Pardon me. Um, let me see. So there's the array. So when I was using the index to interact with this, right? So there we go. Right? So that's using the index to go get that. Um, if I call, right? If I call add here, because this is a sorted, it's a sorted list, hash table does the same thing. Now, unlike an array that is fixed in size, now I'm adding a new element to the end of the array. So now if I add uh, MP4, right? Did I not have MP4 in the original? Right. So if I add MP4, um, let me leave the, can I, oh, uh, rats. Right, let me leave this here. Uh, MP3. So that still works. But if I say file ext, uh, dot add, I can add a new element into the collection. Um, and if I call this uh, compressed video, uh, rats, and I, uh, um, I need a display here because there's more going on. There we go. So it added to it, and if I say display uh, file ext. It's already been added, so where did it go? There we go. So now there's MP4 in the collection now. So write a sorted list, a hash table. These are th these are collections that you can add and remove from. You can interact with them, and they do land in different locations in memory. Um, so the index lets you go and grab specific items in the middle of the array. The add, the remove changes at the end of the array, how you want to interact with it. Um, actually remove, I think you can remove from anywhere in the array also, right? You can remove by key, right? Come here, you, right? Uh, there we go. So I can say remove. I can say remove at and specify an index, but I'll specify the key that I want to remove. MP4. Run that again, and now MP4 is not in the collection. So I've now got random access to be able to interact with it with these types of collections. Okay. Rick has a question here. Um, will this video be uploaded to your YouTube channel? Was a bit late. Um, Rick, so this video is being broadcast on YouTube. It will be saved. It will be in the playlist on YouTube. So for all of you that are watching out here, if you want to go back, you want to watch this later, you want to share with your friends, you want to wake up the dog and say, hey, you got to check out Fritz teaching about C-sharp. I'd love to see a dog that knows C-sharp. Um, YouTube.com slash dot net. Look for the playlist uh, C-sharp with C-sharp Fritz. And you'll see there's, I think, almost 50 videos there now. With, uh, with me teaching all about C-sharp. So, including this series when we ran it for the first time last year. So, um, I didn't want to scroll that mouse, the other mouse. Um, um, Sharaf on YouTube asks, I want to know if iterating over an array is always faster than a list of items the same size and if span is faster than array. Um, a span will be faster than array because it's a value type pointing in memory. So you'll get a span interacting a little bit faster. For most folks who are dealing with a, a reasonably small size of, of elements, um, 10, 100, 1,000 elements, you're not going to see a performance difference. You're just not. Millions of items, you'll see a performance difference. Millions of items concurrently you'll see a performance difference. For most folks who are dealing with the the list of three elements in an array, you won't see a difference. You won't see a difference at all. It really, it, it takes significant pressure to see that. 
most folks who are writing typical interactions with a database for a website or a desktop application or a mobile application, don't worry about span and memory. It, there are other places that you'll be able to optimize your application before you need to worry about those data types. Don't worry about them. You're, you're not at that. There's, there's always going to be places to tune your database interaction, to tune your interactions with a microservice before you need to get down to those micro optimizations of tuning how you're allocating memory. It's, it's something that is the last thing you should be optimizing, not the first. Um, the index set operator. Oh, index of. Um, no, you, you're not going to see. They're pretty much the same. Can you use remove without any parameters? Asks Arshia. Um, so if we just say remove like that. Nope. You need to give it. You need to tell it what to remove. You actually have to tell it, go find, for a sorted list, for a hash table, you need to tell it which one to remove. Alright. Um, so let's talk about the next one here. Cues. Oh, Johnny B. Katz has already shared my link at work. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you can take a look at what the IL is doing. Yep. Um, Yum Yum Rocks on YouTube points out, uh, you can take a look at Sharp Lab if you want to see exactly what's happening. Under the covers, you want to see exactly how memory is being allocated and the processor is being used. You can do that out there. Um, but for 99% of folks that are building applications, you don't need to worry about it. There's other ways to optimize your code before you get there. All right. A, the, a dog that does C Sharp... Uh, Jens Adria on YouTube says a dog that does C sharp would be a C sharp A. Ah, see, oh, I like it. I like it. Um, effective query writing goes a long way. Absolutely. Any courses for the C language? No, I'm sorry. I, I do not have any courses for the C language. Um, you're a beginner in IT, Kushal. Welcome. When to use a for loop or a for each loop in a collection? Um, honestly, for loop you're only going to do if you can randomly access an item in that collection. Otherwise, if you're working with an innumerable collection, like a, a queue, the hash table, the sorted list, you, you can't do a for loop because you don't have a counter to go across that collection. You're going to want to do a for each loop because you can't use a counter to interact with that. Um... Actually, right there's, um, right, isn't there a position, right, there's an at, not remove at, right? I don't think, get by index, there you go. And you can reference, you could do that, but why? Just do a for each at that point. Um, you're doing the exact same thing, and now you're, you're actually allocating a number so that you can go and do that for loop. And, and then allocating memory for that object that that index that you're fetching. Just do it as a for each. So I would only do a for loop with an indexer, with a counter, um, for an array. That's the only time I would do a for loop. Or she is dog walks on their keyboard and learn how to turn on the laptop. <laughs> That's impressive. My, my cat uh, used to lay on my laptop when I had my laptop on my desk all the time. And... Uh, cat was using that to, to keep its butt warm and, and it made it kind of gross when I'd come back from lunch and the cat was sitting on the laptop. Know what I'm saying? Mm. Alright. Moving on. How you doing there, Stealthy Archer? Um, when you add for each when you access? Yes. Yep. Um, how you doing there uh, on YouTube? Uh, how you, it's going? It's it's Yup Mo. Hello. What's up? How am I doing? I'm doing just fine. Thank you for asking. So uh, we talked about the keys there. So let's talk about a queue. I need to pick up speed here a little bit. We've got about a half hour left. So here, a queue is a collection of objects stored and accessed in first in, first out order, just like just like the line at the coffee shop. So you use the in queue method to add elements to the the queue. You add use the 
DQ method to remove elements from the queue. You can also peek to inspect the oldest element in the queue. All right. So let's set up a queue. My queue equals queue, and we're going to add first, second, and we'll add third, and show me the contents of the queue. And it returns first, second, third, in that order, because that's the order that they were added to the queue. And I can use a count property to see how many elements are in the queue. There's three elements. So far, looks a lot like how we were working with our, our hash table or, or sorted list. I'm adding and removing elements, different keyword to work with it. And I can use the peak command to just take a peek, just show me what the first element is in the queue. It doesn't actually remove it, but it shows you what it is, right? There might be decisions you want to make on what's the next element in the queue. So we can use the peek method to interact with that. Now, if I want to get an element off the queue, dequeue it. So dequeue, and it, so it's going to take an element off the queue, show me what it is, and it's the word first because we added first, second, third, so it pulled first. Now if I go back and peek again, second, because my queue now, right, it removed the first element that was in the queue, right? The first element added to the queue is the first one out, just like at the coffee counter. First person up up at the beginning of the queue at the at the coffee shop is who gets to place their order. Yes, I'd like to. I'd like a cinnamon dolce latte, uh, extra whip, uh, extra shot of uh, uh, espresso, and I'll see you over at the counter. And I step away. I've been dequeued. I'm not in the queue anymore. Now Skippy behind me is the first element in the queue. So we can model that same interaction with a queue. All right, and we're going to talk about stack next. Let me take a look at chat. Let me get caught up here. Uh, you use a for loop to loop through the list of Selenium TD tags. There you go. That's a way to do it. Um, how you doing there, Frumius? Welcome in. Good to see you on Twitch. Polywraith, I'm so sorry to hear that. I hope you have a good time. <laughs> I see the tears, but... Uh, Pulse Zero says the add method will throw on duplicate key. Yes. Index set operator will not. Right. So index set will allow you to randomly interact with elements inside your collection. Yes. Um, there is also some kind of priority queue in C-sharp. Uh, th this isn't an airline. Priority queue. Uh, no. Um, yeah, it's like an update. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, exactly. Uh, is, that, is that Zayul Hassan on YouTube? Yeah. Um, Watched my Blazer for Beginners series video. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Um, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how to read the characters. My, my apologies, but I very much appreciate the kind words on the Blazer video series. Um, we're planning a few more videos to add to that series as we get ready for the .NET 6 launch in November. Um, and you'll see a lot of me at .NET Conf. We're getting things all set up. Um, it's going to be a tremendous event for .NET Conf. We're... We're doing our final work on uh, content beginning of this week, and we should have sessions announced by the end of the week. Uh, we're very excited. It's going to be a great event for .NET Conf at the beginning of November. You'll be able to watch .NET Conf live right here, whether you're on YouTube, you're on Learn TV, you're on Twitch. We will be broadcasting to all of them, and you'll be able to tune in to .NET Conf on your favorite streaming service. Watch it on your phone, watch it on your tablet, on your watch. I don't know, is that a Dick Tracy thing you can do now? I've never watched a video on my watch, but if you can do that, you can do that. We'll be broadcasting on all three of those services, and you should be able to find us everywhere. Um, I ordered my coffee using the order async method. Now you step away and await. <laughs> um, folks are queuing up for their lattes there on Twitch. Nice. Uh, Patrick Fowler says, let's go state, love the attire. That's right. Let's go, my Nittany Alliance. Thank you so much. Um, coffee of type T. We're going to get there in just a second. That's coming up next. A stack type is a collection, I mentioned this, where it's last in, first out. So you 
push and pop JavaScript folks are familiar with the push and pop methods. We use those on a stack to add and remove items. You push an item onto the stack, you pop an item off of the stack. And once again, there is a peak method available so that you can examine the next item that could be removed from the stack. It's not gonna remove it, but it just peaks. It just shows you, hey, here's what's next. So think of the stack like a deck of cards and that card that has been last placed on top of the deck is the first card that's going to be removed. So let's create a stack for my hand here. And I'm gonna put the Ace of Diamonds, the Ace of Spades, Nine of Hearts, Nine of Spades, Nine of Clubs. I'm gonna put that in my, that's a full house. That's a full house. Um, that's also Mikey's hand from the end of Rounders. So um, if, uh, if uh, Teddy KGB is out there watching, this is what you lost to. Anyways, so, and then I can display my hand. The Ace of Diamonds is put in first, but because Nine of Clubs was put in last, that's the first element to be returned from the stack, okay? So, the, the card game references here are going to be rich. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, if we peek now, <clears throat> it shows that nine of clubs is the first element to come off the stack, right? Because it's it's a stack of cards. It's the first element to come off of it. Um, I really should have a deck of cards here. And the only cards that I have here are Magic the Gathering cards. I don't have a deck of playing cards. I do have a deck of Windows 7 cards here somewhere, and I don't see them on my bookshelf. No matter. Um, all right. So, and I can also do that for each. A stack is an enumerable type. So I can do that same for each and display, right? This is effectively doing a peek across them. So for each, and it's doing last in, first out. So nine of clubs comes first. Then nine of spades, nine of hearts. If I display my hand dot peek, I get the nine of clubs. And when I pop the element off, I get the nine of clubs. If I run that again, I've modified my hand now. I've taken the nine of clubs off of that. If I run this again, now the nine of spades is the first because that was the last item in that was added to the stack. And when I peek, it's the nine of spades and I'll remove the nine of spades. I run this again and it'll start with the nine of hearts, etc., etc. okay? So we're interacting with that stack of cards. So those are those three basic interactions with those collection types. Keys, values, it's a stack that we can interact with. And you typically don't really care about the types when you're in using these. But what if you do care about the types? What if you do want to interact with those types and 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 it's important that you store only the same type in your stack, your queue, your collection. So we can do that using generics. So let's create a class of type card here. Oh, before I go too much further, let me take a look uh, at chat. Yes, I see that folks referencing the generic syntax already. Uh, like a stack of plates at an all-you-can-eat buffet. That's another good example. Yep. Um, the poker example. Thank you, Curious Drive. You like that? Um, DJ Squared is is referencing um, Salt and Peppa over there. A Royal Flush example? No. Got to go with Rounders. Rounder, the movie Rounders with uh, Matt Damon and um, I'm blanking on his name playing Teddy KGB. Uh, John Malkovich. So that kid's got alligator blood. That's right. Uh, Brian Ski. That's right. Cannonade with the Magic the Gathering command. Um, I, uh, can I show? Can I show? Do I have? Get over here. I got my, you're not going to be able to see it. It's too far away. I, I got um, some of the, the new set that was just released. Pre-release was this past weekend. You see, it doesn't even have a back. It's a two-sided card. This is Arlen 
one of the new cards that was just released this week if you play Magic the Gathering. Um, so, queuing three fire... Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's my fav favorite color to play? Uh, I was very much into white. Um, I think I'm going to be red, either red, black, or red, green with, with this... Uh, with this uh, uh, meta coming up. Olympus Tech. Oh, no need to apologize. You're watching on YouTube. You can rewind and scrub and watch at double speed and hear me with a really cool voice um, if you'd like to. Um, we can talk more about Magic the Gathering later. I got stomped this weekend in a sealed deck tournament for the preview, um, but that's a story for another time. Um, so here, I can declare for my stack, I can declare a class of type card that has ranks and suits. And I can put a constructor here for my card. So I split those IDs so I have the rank and the suit. I have a little bit of notation. And I'll put a two string on here that formats rank dash suit. So I, I have some notation for what the card is, just like I had a little bit earlier. So let's have a deck of cards right it's a new stack because right as we put cards on that stack the the top most the last card that i put on is going to be the first card removed from the deck so we'll create a new stack and we'll start putting cards on the stack now we're putting these cards on just a a plain stack here and we're then able to add a joker card later and add Jack of Hearts. So if we then take a look at our stack, check this out. I've added, look, look, Joker is a different type. It's not a card. Joker's just a string here. It's a wild card, but it's not a card. Inside my, my deck here, right, I've got cards for these other three items and it knows what the rank and suit are. This is a string that's just the value Joker. For the purposes of working with a deck of cards, well, th that's like having a, a, a regular standard deck of 52 cards and, and suddenly, suddenly somebody drops a Magic the Gathering card in it or a Pokemon card. And as you're playing poker, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you've got Ace, Ace, Nine, Nine, and Pikachu. What do you do with Pikachu? Uh, Pikachu, I've got two pair. I want my full house, but I've got Pikachu. P Pikachu doesn't belong there. I don't know what to do with Pikachu. It's mixed things up here. Hmm. We can, and and this is the the default set of collections that are available. I'm going to take a card off the top of the deck. I get a, a Jack of Hearts. Take the next one, and I get Joker. Okay, that's a wild card. I get a King of Hearts. I get an Ace of Diamonds. And now the stack is empty. And I get an error that... Mm. So here's where you may want to use Peak or you may want to use Length to ensure you don't go off the end of the stack. Okay? So uh, that's why we want to start using things like generics. Let me take a look at chat. Squirrel voice mod for free? No. <laughs> Wonder if this stream will get tagged MTG on ClipTalk? No. Uh, the Jeff of Hearts. That's right. It's the Jeff of Hearts. Thank you, Arshia. Yes, it's the Jeff of Hearts. Uh, thank you for having closed captions. You're very welcome. I always try to have closed captions enabled uh, everywhere so that it's clear for folks who want to participate. Um, so we had a deck of cards, but somehow that Joker got in there, right? Or, or in the other example I was describing, you got a Pikachu in there. That's not a, that's not a card that fits in the deck of cards that we expect. We expect our deck of cards to always have a standard playing card. It's one of the 13 ranks. It's one of the four suits. Joker is something else. Pikachu is different type of card. It's not a playing card. Generic is a way for us to declare the collection will always have the same type. These other collections that we've been looking at, we can put whatever object type we want. Numbers, strings, dates. You saw me mix and match them, and just like we did with that previous example, 
with adding a joker in with the rest of our playing cards. If we want to force that deck of cards to always contain a standard playing card, we can declare our stack with a type using angle brackets next to it. And this will set that type, kind of lock it in and give us a little bit of type protection around our collection to ensure that you can only add and access and remove objects of that type from the collection. So some of those collections that we saw previously in the notebook here, those are available as generic types, but the common ones you're gonna see folks use are list of T and dictionary of T right there. Okay, let's take a look at a few examples. These are easy ways for you to work with those collections. So if we have a list of type T, right? So we declare this and we can randomly add, remove, and interact with items. So if we have a list of cards, we'll declare a new list of type card. You see how it does the angle brackets and specifies the type inside of there. We declared our card class earlier. So we have the card here and we can now add those new cards to this and we can display, well, show me that type and you see look at this this is a system collections generic list of type submission 60 that's from up above uh but it's a of type card and if i scroll down there's my cards notice unlike when we looked at the the types earlier when we saw it display it's showing me it, it's not including the type in the output here because we know what the type is. The type is always uh, right here, card. It's So it's just emitted, here's what these things are. So we can still randomly access using that indexer, we can still randomly access in a list, anything in there using that. So give me the third element. There it is, it's the nine of clubs. So uh, we use these the two index, so I got the nine of clubs, okay? Now we can insert to add a card into the middle. Couldn't do this with, uh, with the arrays and some of the other collection types. We can insert into the middle of a list at a specific index. So let's insert the three of hearts in at the third position. And there it is. So we inserted it at index two which is the third position there's the three of hearts and the nine of clubs gets pushed down so we, it reallocates memory moves things around puts it back in there and destroys the old copy of things okay just like when we re resized the array let me pause for a second take a look at chat i've got about 15 minutes to go it's like someone shuffling it in that's right yep uh we'll take a look at dictionary in just a little bit oh i see the clip We'll take a look at the clip uh, offline. Thank you so much, 3D Polyrath. We can use index of to locate that object inside the collection, inside the list collection. There you go. You can also ask the list of type card where, where it is by using the element at and say, well, go get me the element at this index. So at index one is the, the Jeff of diamonds. Um, I like that. I got to stick with that. I'm, that was the joke I told last year. Gosh. There, um, so the list is generically typed to card, and we read the list of type card in, in English as list of type card. That's how we read this type, right? List of type card. So we can't add that joker, right? Doesn't work. Cannot convert from string... Where'd it go? Cannot convert from string to card. Can't do it. So we get that protection. You can even see the red underline here. Can't do it. Uh, cannot convert, right? So we get that protection even before you compile. It, it doesn't try to do that interaction. So another good thing around the generics that you're interacting with. So there was a question there from DJ Squared about dictionaries. So a dictionary is a key value pair stored a bit like a list here. And we define our key as one type, our value as a different type, and we specify a comma between them. 
So we can now say that, remember the file extensions sample we saw earlier? We can say dictionary of type string, of type string, and here's my key value pairs that I'm adding. And I'm getting that type safety in here. There they are. But if I try, if I try to make this not JPEG, if I try to call this instead three, right? I've already got the red underline there. Mm, can't do it. Can't convert it from integer to a string. It needs to be a string there. All right, so I get that. Once again, type safety, it's helping me write better code. And I can reference items in that dictionary, not, by the, not just by the index, but also by the key, just like we saw earlier. So there it is, JPEG compressed images. I do have the, the type safety, um, I'm sorry, the, the key, unique key constraint, so I can't add the same key twice, okay? Um, and similarly, I can't add something that doesn't belong. I can't add, right? Look at that. Mm, I want to add a card. No, nope, can't do it. Cannot convert from card to string. Not available. So type safety. This is very important, right? And this helps to guard that to ensure that your collection only contains the types that you want. You may want to allow many different types in your collection. That's okay. Use those collection types we saw earlier. But when you want it to only contain one type, use these generic types. Before I get to hash set, let me take a look at chat. I got about 12 minutes to go here. Um, you follow all the jokes and lessons. Thank you, Arshia. <laughs> uh, typically, you use these as enums versus strings. Yes. Yes. Yum Yum Rocks on YouTube points out you could use enumerations. For the file extension sample, you would want to use... Um, enumerations to ensure that it stays within that known collection of things. Sure. Um, this is not Python. This is C-sharp. This is all C-sharp. Um, types are fantastic for JavaScript. Yes, it's called TypeScript. Am I using some kind of plugin in Visual Studio Code to have different sections? This is called a .NET interactive notebook. This is a, a feature that's available to you in Visual Studio Code. It's available to you on GitHub. If you go to the GitHub repository, I think, am I signed in over here? Uh, I might be. So if you go to the GitHub repository for this, go down into notebooks and you hit the period key on your keyboard. Or it's not. Do I need to be on the root? It's not doing it. Why isn't it doing it? Is it because I'm not signed in? It's probably because I'm not signed in. Um, I, th I guess I'm signed in over on Firefox. Do, 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 do. And nope, I'm not signed in over here either. I'm not gonna go through the sign in. You hit the period key, you get this and it's all installed and running for you. So. Um, <laughs> when would you use immutable collections? So I'm not going to get into immutable collections too much here. Um, but immutable collections are a collection that doesn't change. So um, if you want to have a collection that cannot be changed, you would use an immutable collection. Is there a course I have I can follow to learn C Sharp? Um... You can also go to, th that's weird. Uh, you can also go to dot.net slash learn, and we've got a bunch of learning material there for you. Links to courses on LinkedIn Learning, uh, courses on uh, Microsoft Learn, videos like this one. Um, and of course, we have live video content all week long at live.net, live.dot.net. You can find us broadcasting and answering questions all week long um, and and helping folks out. I've got about nine minutes to go here. Let's see if we can get through the end of this. A hash set is a high performance collection that does not contain duplicate entries. So we can create a hash set of type card. Once again, this will index based on the hash of the object stored. So it's store a Jeff of clubs, an ace of clubs, a nine of diamonds, and we'll create a three of hearts. We can add that in and display the collection. And 
Jeff of clubs, ace of clubs, nine of diamonds, three of hearts. Okay. So, and actually it's stored it based on the index. Mm. Um, so if we attempt to add a three of hearts a second time, this actually doesn't throw an error and says, okay, I've already got one in there. Here's, and, and I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to throw an error. I already know what that is. You've already got one in the collection that you can work with. It doesn't add some sort of indicator that there's now two of them. No, there's already one in there. There it is. Okay. We can also create our own generic classes. So there are official, there is official documentation on generics that you can click through right here and learn more about how to create your own classes that can be generically um, changed around here. So I'm going to create a class called Fritz Set of type T. So we're going to allow you to define some sort of a type that you want to put in the Fritz Set. Now, I'm going to define an inner list here. It's normally not publicly scoped, but I'm going to make it publicly scoped just so we can take a look at it. We can inspect it a little bit here as part of this. So in my collection that I'm defining, I'm going to allow you to add an item, and I'm going to insert it. But if there's zero items, I'll put it in at index zero. If there's more than zero items... I'm going to put it at a random spot in the collection, all right? Just put it somewhere. I don't care where it is. It, it's it's the ADHD organized collection. We're going to just put it randomly wherever you want in there. So now if we insert some numbers into that Fritz set, so we'll add one, two, three, four, five. After the first item, when it adds, it'll randomly place those numbers. And when we see the collection, now it outputs well, three, four, one, five, two. They're randomly placed in that collection. If I run it again, it's some other order. It's randomly allocating them. Now that, that might be pretty good for the start of a deck of cards collection. It's like a stack, but different because we're going to put our cards in there and shuffle them up in every which order. So let's create a Fritz set that holds cards. And we'll add Ace of Diamonds, Nine of Diamonds, the Jeff of Hearts, Three of Clubs, and Two of Spades. And if we output the information about that deck, well, look at that, right? Come here, scroll down just a smidge. Come here, there it is. So Three of Clubs was put in the collection fourth. Well, it's first. Then the Two of Spades, that was put in last. Then the Jeff of Hearts, etc., etc. All right, and if I run that again, now it's in a different order, okay? So we have something now that kind of shuffles as we put things into our our collection that's kind of cool all right um so you can also force using a generic type of object and and you lose that compile time constraints so if we create another collection here and we add the card the jeff of hearts and we add a joker well they're now in whatever order here and right we can get even weirder Right, and let's add Pikachu and Joker Pikachu and then the Jeff of Hearts, right? And you see they're randomly in different orders, okay? Um, so what type of object are each element in the object set? So it's a card and then a string, right? So you can store those different objects when you say your generic type is of type object, right? You're, you're effectively breaking it out of the ability to interact with and have that type constraint and those, um, those properties you're able to interact with on those. I'm going to briefly touch on link here. Language integrated query. I keep calling it language integrated natural query. Language integrated query. It's L-I-N-Q. Um, refers to a collection of technologies that allow you to query data. So uh, I like to start with link to objects. We're going to get more into link, I believe it's next time. So if we take a look at that Fritz card collection again, we add, some, let's load up some more cards into that using my Fritz set. So I'll execute that. And now, now I have a deck object that's loaded up with a bunch of different cards. Now we have some standard query operators we can use to analyze that collection. 
I've got about three minutes to go here. I'm going to run through this very quickly. So if we take a look at the count, there's 13 items in my, my deck of cards that I created there. And if we say, well, show me just those where the suit equals diamonds, right? It's going to count those where suit equals diamonds. This isn't from the playlist. We jumped off the playlist. There we go. So it'll sort through and get me that collection where it, this test is satisfied. So I get there are six cards that are diamonds. So you can use the where method on that collection there to say where suit equals diamonds. And it'll give me those items where the suit is diamonds. And I can even do a where and chain on the count method out here, right? So let's put some carriage returns in there so it's a little bit easier to see. I can chain that together so that it'll do that where and then give you the count. So where the suit is diamonds and I get this child collection, right? This subset of diamonds. I've got two minutes to go here and it'll, there are six elements in there. So I can do that where and I can count and add that filter as well. And it shows me that diamonds where count where the rank is ace. I only have one card in there. Okay. You can use the select method here to project, to change the shape of the object you're returning. So give me the diamonds and select, show me just the rank properties. And I get just those strings of the rank properties. Right? So I can say, well, any will say, well, give me a true or false if this condition is met is the rank queen. So I can say, well, do you have any queens? No, false. Okay, go fish. Go draw another card, right? Um, do you have a flush? Or are all the cards the same suit? So there's an all method you can use that says, make sure this is met. No, false. And we can chain these together. So there are f a couple other things here. Order by, I am out of time, friends. I need to wrap this up. To our friends that are watching on Learn TV, it's been great having you. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Let me head back over here. There we go. So good to see you. Thank you so much for tuning in, friends. I really appreciate you joining over here. It's been a blast talking. All of the notes, all of the documentation, all the samples are out there on the GitHub repository. Um, if you're watching the YouTube recording, there's a link just below me in the description, right there, that you can grab to go and uh, watch this. For those of you in the chat rooms watching live, there's a link right there if you want to go download the notebooks and give it a shot. Um, all right. My apologies, I went a little bit long there. We will, I believe we're covering more on Link next time. Yes, Link is our topic next time. So we didn't get into the last couple bits of the, uh, of the notebook. We'll cover all of that next time. Thank you so much for tuning in. Those of you that are watching on YouTube, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And for those of you that are watching on Twitch, I'm going to set up for a raid. Uh, let me see who else is streaming on the big Twitch TV network, and we'll get you connected to another tech streamer over here. You know what? Um, our friends at Code It Live are streaming right now, talking about web development. Let me get you connected over to them. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you joining us over here on the Visual Studio channel. When you're done checking out the Code It Live channel, those of you that are watching both on YouTube and Twitch, make sure you come on back here a little bit later in about an hour or two. My friends uh, from the Docs team will be back and they'll be teaching all about and talking about things from the Microsoft Docs. I don't know what's on their schedule for today. Have a great time. I hope you have a great day of learning and I will see you next time. Take care.